We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? This morning for our convocation sermon, I want to draw your attention to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 5, we'll be looking together at verses 15 through 17. Ephesians chapter 5, we shall be considering together verses 15 through 17. This is a great book, of course, written by the Apostle Paul, a great letter where he sets forth in these opening three chapters this great exposition on what is conversion, what is the Christian life, all that God has done in us and through us and for us in Christ Jesus. And then we get to the second half of the book, and he tells us what that means for us, for the local church, for the home, for our lives personally, individually, human relationships, and so much more. My mind has been drawn to these three verses, and particularly verse 16 in recent weeks, and you'll gather why during the course of this sermon. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, redeem the time. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let us pray. Father, in this moment, I pray you would speak to us from these verses. Father, I pray that this passage and the words I speak will apply to each individual in this room in ways that are clearly brought to bear in their lives by the work of the Spirit and the power of your Holy Word. Father, we pray now this request in Jesus' name. Amen. When you read your Bible, and your New Testament in particular, you see that the Bible depicts the Christian status in this world, often in terms of contrast, saved or lost, with sight spiritually or blind, children of light, children of darkness, sheep, goats, wheat, tares, heart of flesh, heart of stone, adopted outside the family of God, sons of God, sons of Satan. We are also reminded of another great category contrast, and that is those who live in Christ as being marked by godly wisdom in comparison to those who are apart from Christ, who are a part of the foolishness of this world system. Biblical wisdom is entirely counterintuitive, right? We know this instinctively because biblical values are so counterintuitive to our world in the year 2021. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, we are presented with this reality of of the foolishness of the world system and how the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to to the ears and the hearts and the minds of fallen humanity. Nonetheless, with confidence, we are presented with the fact that the gospel is indeed God's perfect plan. To follow Christ and to live for Him and to obey His Word is indeed the wisest course of action any of us can take. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 tells us that the Scriptures are the wisdom of God leading to salvation. And as I've already referenced, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 presents to us the gospel as being the fool, perceived as foolishness by the world, but being the perfect genius wisdom of God. We look at these verses and we see this presentation of wisdom versus foolishness. Verse 15, Paul tells us, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. 
And the mark of one who is wise in Christ and wise in godliness and wise in this present age is the one who is redeeming the time. And it's all the more important to do so because the days are evil. And as we do, then we will not be foolish, but we'll be understanding what the wisdom of the Lord is. Now, I suspect that each one of you in the room this morning, especially the more years you have on yourself, you think about time more than you did a decade or two or three ago. You are struck by how rapidly time passes with each passing year as your kids grow and you see them with each passing year. And you have this mental clock in the back of your mind where you're counting down how many years or perhaps months or perhaps weeks you still have them in your home and a part of your immediate day-to-day family. We live instinctively with a sense of time set in our hearts, and our world, our world reminds us as well, because our world is always there these days to give us an additional life hack, to remind us to update our bucket list, to to tell us you only live once. Well, what I want to do in the minutes that follow is challenge that type of thinking and push back against that type of thinking, and rather think with you from these verses about a biblical approach and a biblical mindset of redeeming the time. Notice with me first in these verses, it's a call that we think soberly, that we think soberly. Notice verse 15. And we now were in this this section of what I refer to as the therefore sections. After chapter 3, where Paul ends with this this great statement of of praise, this responsive statement of praise at the end of chapter 3, we get into these therefores. In chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And then he keeps going here, and he gets down. So verse 17 of chapter 4, So this I say, in essence, therefore, walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And then verse 25, therefore, lay aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Then chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Chapter 5, verse 7, therefore, do not be partakers with them. Then verse 15, therefore, be careful how you walk. In light of the rich theological foundation laid in chapters 1 through 3, we get this this sequential dose of therefores coming at us, and especially in light of verse 14, this reminder, perhaps this ancient early church hymn, that we have been awakened. Awake, sleeper, verse 14. Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Therefore, as one who's been awakened spiritually, therefore, be careful how you walk. Each one of us is in danger day to day, hour to hour, moment to moment to walk foolishly. We have seen lives wrecked in recent years, some distantly through news stories, some closer to home through families and churches and ministries we know, where people have taken steps towards foolishness. And we tend to think of foolishness as a category, as those great moral blunders. And yes, those are foolish. But note here, we're presented in these verses a reminder that it is a great act of foolishness not to redeem the time for the Lord. We're presented here in verse 15 with this call to think soberly, to be careful how you walk, to literally take caution. Walk is a recurring expression in the New Testament for how we live the Christian life. We are to live it not as unwise, but as wise. And again, we tend to think of wisdom as, as kind of the, the, those, 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 those life skills, those life experiences, those points of basic knowledge that old people, older people, do or should pass on to younger people. We call our dad or our granddad about how to change the oil in our car, how to do basic automotive service. You know, our mothers to get, to get this recipe or, or that word of, word of advice or counsel. And we, we kind of look to people who are older with more life experience for these helpful words of, of counsel, how to fix a, a leaky valve or how to negotiate an automobile purchase or how to find a spouse or what have you. But here I would argue this morning that Paul is not thinking about the practicalities of life. Lost people need to know how to buy a, buy a car. Lost people don't know how to, how to call an HVAC guy when the air conditioning goes out. 
Paul here is arguing, I believe, a deeply biblical and spiritual call that we redeem the time, that we walk wisely, spiritually speaking, that we, in essence, set our minds on things above, not on things below. So what is Exhibit A of doing that? Notice verse 16. Exhibit A of not living foolishly, of living wisely, verse 16, is making the most of your time, as my NASV says, or most traditionally this phrase is quoted, by redeeming the time. I love the word redeem that shows up in many of your translations this morning. I'm just going to borrow it this morning. Redeem the time. Redeem means to to buy back. When we think of redemption, it means Christ has bought us. He has purchased us through his death. Redeem here, this word here means means to buy back. And it's not that word chronos from which we get our word chronology as in a sequence of events. Time here is that word kairos, a, a sense of opportunity, a fixed time, a moment. And so Paul is is not saying that we live life in a hurried way. Chronologically, we're always checking our our stopwatch. We say, no, we live life in a way that we are being strategic and wise about this ministry season. These ministry opportunities, this context ministerially, and you make the most of it, you redeem it, you, as it were, you buy it. This is a sermon unto itself, I suppose. We could talk all morning and beyond the morning about what it means to steward our time wisely. I don't want to bring this morning a, you know, a, a list of 10 helpful strategies to get more out of your day, or eight ways to harness your, to, your to-do list, or seven ways to get your email inbox to zero. But rather... I want to press in in verse 17 and challenge us in the the core of our being about the basic biblical and spiritual realities here that we are in accordance to verse 16 to redeem the time by this moment. Notice why. Not because you're getting older, not because time's flying, but because the days are evil. The days are evil. Here's how time's moving. 25 years ago this fall, I was an upstart college student. Think of where you were 25 years ago. Most of you who just heard me say that weren't alive 25 years ago. (laughs) 25 years ago, I was an upstart college student, had not met the young woman who became my wife, but soon thereafter. 25 years ago, quarter century, gone. 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, to this month, 20 years ago, my wife and I were loading, had loaded up all we had in the preceding weeks and moved 600 miles away to attend seminary. 20 years ago. And there we were, and by faith, and newlyweds, no children, of course, and and there, and believe God had called us to ministry and pursuing that. And we, we, we called all the friends we knew and had them come to our little house. And, and I rented a 26-foot U-Haul who, where her uncle Bobby worked. So we got a discount on the rental. So it's a no-brainer. We rent that U-Haul. A 26-foot U-Haul. And I called all my brothers and their friends and all our college ministry friends, everybody, and came over and loaded our house in the morning. And it was like a cartoon scene that we're like pushing the final things in as I pull down the rack to close it. You know, it's like trying to cram it in there. We had a remarkable amount of stuff for, for newlyweds, and we, we closed that door, and I was so proud of myself. We had packed early, and it was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we were going to leave the next morning you know, before dawn to drive north. And I, I went to, to pull the U-Haul from the house that we're moving out of to station to my wife's, in-law, my wife's parents' house where we spend the night before we drove north, and they were going to drive with us and help us move. And on my way across town, the, the check engine light comes onto the U-Haul. And what do you do with that when you're supposed to drive 600 miles the next day? So I did what seemed wise. You know, young man, I just zipped over to the U-Haul place, and I drove up, and I said, hey, I'm leaving at 6 a.m. in the morning, and we just loaded this U-Haul, and the check engine light's on, and and, um, what what can y'all do about it? And the guy said to me rather casually, he said, well, um, well, I don't know about the light, but but really you're going to, I guess if I were you, you're going to have to unload your U-Haul and put it in that U-Haul. 
And uh, it was the first event in my life where I felt myself like growing a spine. And I, I said, no, you're going to have to find a mechanic to look at this U-Haul. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, some guy rambled out there. And uh, I mean, I could not unload a U-Haul by myself and rambled out there and, and kind of got it working. We drove it. And the next morning, we loaded up our car, our U-Haul. And, and the engine worked, but the air conditioning went out literally the first five minutes of the 600-mile drive. And so we were sweating 600 miles in August in that U-Haul. It rained the whole way, which meant we had to keep the windows down because the windows were fogged, but meant we couldn't keep the rain out. So my wife, the ultimate trooper, was there with me, and we drove the whole way north in that U-Haul 20 years ago. Some of you made a similar move 20 days ago. Some of you really coded yourself here months ago, years ago, recently. And you look back, and it's amazing how things fly. 25 years ago, college, 20 years ago, moving to seminary, 10 years ago, nearly, I'm now in my, about to start my 10th year here. Where has it gone? I was going through a prayer journal recently this past week, and I was looking for something, and, and I, I turned to um, that page, and I was kind of glancing, oh, I wonder what I was praying for that day, you know, and this was, I looked down on that date, and I looked down, and I, I was in my prayer journal praying for one of our children who was then six, and I made a note just to think that a third of their time in our home is already gone, and now to see that child as a young adult. And then we think, of course, not the 25 years, the 20 years, the 10 years, children growing. We've been thinking about time by the minute in recent days about Afghanistan, haven't we? Can we get people out by the day? Can we get Christians out by the day? Can we get Christians out by the hour? Can we get people out by the hour? All of that screams at us practically, naturally, to redeem the time. But as I said earlier, the issue here is not that time is flying, therefore we must be strategic with our time. Paul's argument assumes that because that is a factor common to all humanity. The issue is not that we think strategically about our waning hours, but we think strategically in light of the fact that the days are evil. Verse 17 does not mean that we should be on the never-ending quest for additional life hacks to make the most of our time, that we are on this never-ending quest for productivity tools, that we keep a refined and focused bucket list, always trying to work through it. It doesn't mean that we're to live life with excessive introspection, always trying to figure out what we want to do in our life, when, by the way, that's just what happened while you are thinking about it the past 20 years. It doesn't mean that we think humanistically about only one career path, only one opportunity. If I don't t take this doorway, then maybe it'll pass us by. It doesn't mean that we think, what will I accomplish in my brief years on this planet? That's not what Paul's saying. What it should mean is this, that through Christ, we are to honor biblical stewardship. Think about who you are in Christ, brothers and sisters, the roles God has given you. Husband, wife, young man, young woman, teammate, student, professor, administrator. The roles God has given you, the responsibilities God has given you, the relationships God has given you, those primary categories of kingdom stewardship in light of the fact that the days are evil and we must redeem our time. You know, COVID came out of nowhere last spring and hit like a tsunami in all of our lives. And there was so much that we didn't like about it and we don't like about it. And I'm talking obviously about the death and disease and illness that it's brought, but so much of the disruption, we didn't like not being able to go to our favorite sports games. We didn't like not going to go to our favorite restaurants. We didn't like not being able to travel. We didn't like, 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 we didn't like. I'll tell you what I did like. I liked about two months of like unbroken family meals together at home. Didn't we all like that? And it took a, a pandemic for many of us to interrupt us to refocus on these relationships and, res and responsibilities and these roles. Redeeming the time for us means that we honor Christ by biblically stewarding the key roles and responsibilities and relationships He's given us. It means, secondly, that we should focus on our life counting for Christ. 
Many of us came of age ministerially. Many of us came of age ministerially. Hearing a guy named John Piper preach a sermon, write a book entitled, Don't Waste Your Life. And many of you know the story, that sermon originated for the first time, I, I believe, uh, at, the, at the context of the, of the Passion Conference. And in bad weather, and Piper's there preaching, and he tells the story of the elderly couple in Florida. Uh, I think it was featured like in um, a weekly periodical of, of this elderly couple who was collecting seashells. And that was like their, their crowning achievement in life as senior adults, to be able to take early retirement and collect seashells for the rest of your life. And Piper said, very prophetically, what a wasted life. That sermon and those words continue to ring through evangelicalism, and they should. We want to focus our lives on what counts for Christ. As the old couplet goes, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Number one, it means that we should honor Christ through biblical stewardship of our time, roles, relationships, responsibilities. Number two, we should focus on our lives counting for Christ in light of this evil age. Number three, we should understand that the issue is not my time, but his time. Every time we do futuristic planning, we better have a a big, bold sense of Deo Valente, if the Lord wills. And every time I hear someone say, you know, I need some more me time. I need some more me time. No, we, it's not my time. It's no more my time as it's my money. It's the Lord's money. It's the Lord's time. He's entrusted this to us. He's entrusted this to you. He's entrusted this to me. And so we think not about my time. We think about his time and what he's afforded to us. Fourthly, it should bring ministry focus. It should bring ministry focused. You're here in this room. Uh, you, you are focused on ministry. This is not to, not to uh, challenge you. But beyond this room, and perhaps in this room, certainly around this room and beyond this campus, we, we have to remember what the Lord has called us to do. And the ministry focus, verse 16, should bring about Sometimes I have conversations that go like this, and they go like this more often than I would like to have to admit it. I'm preaching in a conference. I'm at our booth at an event. I bump into a prospective student on campus, and it goes something like this. Ah, tell me your story, and they talk about the, where they grew up, where they're from. Tell me your call to ministry, and it's kind of like a call to ministry story of this verse and, and this passage and that book and this pastor. And it's, Okay, we're trending right. Here's how I came to know Christ. Here's where I'm from. Here's my home church. Here's my call to ministry. Well, tell me about those steps for ministry. And then it begins to really fall off the rails. It becomes really roundaboutish and really kind of sortish and really perhaps maybe-ish. And, and, and really like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm called, you know, and so I'm thinking one day once, you know, everything's right, all the stars are properly aligned, one day I'll begin to prepare for ministry. And then I hope one day, then when that's done, I'll, I'll, I'll get into ministry. And I just want to give them a holy kick in the pants. And not because my job here is to lead and build an institution, but because that is a horrible way to steward your life if you have, in fact, been called to ministry. God is not looking for hypothetical ministers. He's not looking for one-day ministers. He's not looking for futuristic potential ministers. Yes, clarify your conversion. Yes, clarify your calling if there's ambiguity there. But if that is settled and you are indeed in Christ and you're indeed called by Christ to ministry, then get on with it. Pursue your preparation urgently. Put yourself on the place of mentorship. Embrace ministry preparation at a place like this or similarly healthy institution and then get on with ministry service. Don't spend your life saying, one day I'll probably do it, only to look back decades later and say, I should have, would have, could have done it. My sense of the call to ministry, my understanding of the call to ministry, is so grand, and I believe appropriate and biblically right, that to not sit up and follow the Lord's call is a treacherous way to respond. The gospel call is promiscuous. The Call to ministry is not. The gospel call is indiscriminate. 
The call to ministry is not. It's a specific calling, a focused calling. We are part of a conscripted force. And so as though Paul is saying to us in this context through verse 16 is, the days are evil, look around. Our world is collapsing. Christians are facing deprivation and persecution. The church is in need. The nations are longing for messengers. Redeem the time. Go. Pursue him. Don't waste your life. We must move on quickly. And thirdly, we are to follow submissively. Notice verse 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How do you act foolishly? A, by stewarding poorly your time. B, by not pursuing the will of the Lord. And again, here we're back to applying this in our context to that call to ministry. If you have discerned through your study of Scripture and through your elders and pastors speaking into your life and your church affirming that God has called you to ministry, then, then good grief. That is the Lord's will for your life. Then pursue it. All of you in this room today, you have a similar calling that, that is not to ministry, but you're here at Spurgeon College. It's about the marketplace. It's about the Accelerate degree, or it's about the Business Leadership degree, or it's about, about the Intercultural Studies degree, or whatever it is. And it may not be an explicit ministry calling, but it's still a calling that God has on your life to use you in the marketplace in a way that brings Him much glory for years to come. And so really there are two responses. Number one is to sort that out. And for many of you on the front end of your studies, you have plenty of time and there's a lot, there are more question marks than answers and that is fine. We, we exist to help you sort that out. But as that is sorted out, and as God gives you clarity from his word and through wise counsel as to what he set before you to do in the marketplace or in ministry proper, then get on with seeking, finding, and following the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord. The will of the Lord. And this we know. Time isn't just fleeting. Time is unpredictable. It's not just that your life will pass rather rapidly if God gives you 80 plus or minus years. It's that God may have your appointment to meet Him today. What will you be found doing in the meantime, I'm reminded of Jesus' words, which charge us so powerfully. You recall the story in John 9. Jesus was passing by, and he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man who's blind? Or his parents that he'd be born blind? Believing that they, it, it, it was something. Someone did something wrong for him to be blind. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. He's saying, in essence, trust the providence of God. But notice verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. For night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You can draw a line from chapter 9, verse 4 of the Gospel of John to chapter 5, verse 16 of Ephesians. It's the, our Lord and the Apostle, in essence, saying the same thing. Redeem the time for the days are evil. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this new semester and all that it promises. We ask you to help us to be faithful, to protect us from the evil one, to, for your grace to be upon us as we continue to deal with COVID and to protect this community from it. And Father, we, we ask that these verses, that you would enable us to be those who are marked by wisdom and not foolishness, those who perceive our times 
and make the most of our time because the days are evil. And those who are zealous in our pursuit of your will in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.